Okay, my name is William Foles, I'm a wildlife vet. Um, we are on Buffalo Cliff Game Reserve near Grahamstown, working with Rhino Rescue Project today to do horn infusions um, on Rhino. It's been four years since uh, the horn infusions were first done here, so this is a, a repeat procedure uh, on their Rhino. The whole idea is to devalue Rhino's horn so that it becomes less attractive to poachers um, and to be a major deterrent to that seek to consume this product over in countries such as Vietnam and China. Um, so just about to get going with all the equipment. A uh, team has come down from Pretoria, um, Lorinda Hearn and, and her team, and we'll be mobilizing Rhino shortly and infusing this uh, toxin mixture into the horn. Um, and we'll see how we go today. Obviously, um, a lot of logistics, a lot of people that are required to do an operation like this. But hopefully it all goes smoothly and um, we'll get the job done. So I'm uh, Lorenda Hearn from Rhino Rescue Project. We're here at Buffalo Cliff today to do horn treatments on the rhinos as an additional anti-poaching measure. So what that means is we're going to be infusing the horns with the a liquid dye and a, and a toxin to make them undesirable to poachers and users of rhino horn. There's a misconception that exists that we are trying to do the end users of rhino horn harm and that's not really the point at all. The point is to make the animals less attractive targets to poachers. So we've absolutely taken the, the ethical questions on board. Well, number one, you don't want to have to sedate animals, you know, just gratuitously and for, for no real reason at all. Um, and the, the mere fact that we feel we have to do something like this is a testament to how bad the problem has become in, in this country. The fact that we have to resort to such extreme measures where animals have to be darted and their horns infused with toxins to make them, um, to make them less useful to, to the, the consumers that, that buy them. So that ethical issue obviously is, is something that we have to take on board and, and that we've considered and, and we've, we've also looked at, at end users. We want to make the, the treatment potent enough obviously to be a deterrent but we certainly don't want anyone to die from the, the use of a contaminated rhino horn and that's why the compounds that we use are ectoparasiticides so 100% safe for the animal but obviously as with all ectoparasiticides in, inadvisable for humans to handle or consume so you would present with symptoms but it is unlikely that someone would actually die from a from a treatment. It really is meant to be a deterrent. If a, if a treated animal is poached, effectively the treatment hasn't done what it's meant to. So horn treatments or horn infusions have proven to be a remarkably successful anti-poaching strategy um, in terms of being a poaching deterrent. Um, in the past seven years that we've been doing this work, we've only had seven reported losses. Um, of, of animals and that's a triumph by any standard if you consider that the average daily rate in terms of poaching losses is between three and four animals. Um, so as a, as a poaching deterrent it's been surprisingly successful actually. The technology obviously is constantly evolving and that's um, because we, are, we know that we're dealing with syndicates and, and to stay one step ahead of them you have to constantly evolve and, imp in, and improve the process. So we started with infusion which was a minimally invasive way, way of doing the procedure on the animals. They of course are our primary concern so we didn't want to do something that would end up doing more harm than good. Um, and we have since d developed the technology to a point where it's not only an infusion that's being done, but we're starting to experiment with the use of radioactive isotopes to make horns highly detectable through ports so that they can't be illegally smuggled from, from the country. So overall, we are very happy with the successes. The only, the only drawback there is is that we don't feel procedures like this are being done on a large enough scale just yet to have the kind of meaningful impact that it could have. So, so we started Rhino Rescue Project in 2010 and we've been doing these treatments now for, for the past seven years approximately. I believe it's, it's saved our animals. We've, uh, you know, we've touched wood, we haven't had the incident, and it's been going forward. Obviously, there's been advances in technology, and so we're going to do uh, the rest of the herd that hasn't been done. And
and uh, yeah, enjoy the day. And we're gonna start obviously our first animals on the ground here. We'll start with the Land Cruiser, and if we don't come right, we'll get airborne and do it by the chopper. So thanks for attending, everybody, and uh, let's get it done. Thanks. Progressing sort of a stock standard way you'll see after the first animal basically how it works. Um, but if you have either William or Sean, uh, Beverly, the other vets and attendants, instruct you to return to your vehicles, I'd like to, to ask you to do that as quickly as possible because if at any point during the course of the procedure the animal becomes unstable, we're going to wake them right up. We're not going to, to keep them down on the ground. Um, you guys might get roped in during the course of the procedure. We always need some extra hands. So if there's a rhino rollover that needs to happen or some, some forms that need to be filled out, uh, you might get to get asked to assist us in that regard. Uh, please, as always, when, when you're working with, with wild animals, don't have your backs to them, keep your eyes open, be aware and awake and alert. Please don't touch the dart site on the animal um, at all. If, if at, at all possible, don't pick up the dart or anything and, and handle it. Uh, Sean would be able to give you more details on that, but certainly it's not something you would want to, to ingest or consume. Um, as Warren said, we did the procedures here for the first time four years ago. The technology has progressed, progressed quite a lot since then. Um, and we're excited to, to have you guys here and to, to spread the word. So feel free to take pictures and to post them on social media. Obviously, depending on what Wendy and Warren want, in terms of mentioning where you are, perhaps you no, we have a problem. keep that information under wraps.
detail here. Yeah, I don't think I would see you do one. Okay. Oh. Yeah, she's got 18, 18 to 20 months old, yeah. Okay, so the first run has been done. Um, Sean, the vet, is just waking up at the moment. Um, that uh, procedure took just under 20 minutes. So a nice quick infusion, and um, anesthetically she looks good. So within the next two minutes she should be back up in her feet with the toxin in her horn, and hopefully she'll just go back to life again on Buffalo Cliff.
there's so many helicopter patrols. They're very used to the helicopter. Oh, that's good. That's why they don't uh, they just run you off into business. My name is Lynn Westover Jr. I am 36 years old from Seattle, Washington, and I am the director of operations of South Africa operations for VETPAW, which is Veterans Empowered to Protect African Wildlife. So, you so specific questions at me or whatever. So, VETPAW's mission is to utilize uh, 
mainly post 9 11 veterans because they would have had an uh, understanding in irregular warfare and terrorism and the same type of ter terrorist networks, uh, criminal networks like cartels, whether it's moving illicit substances such as people or, or drugs or, or whatever the, the trade may be, ivory, uh, it has the same behaviors. And so, therefore, of the mission of that pause to use that garner that experience from from veterans like myself and Seth to uh, help enrich and empower the, the reserves and the personnel in the reserves. Uh, so what we do is we come in and, and train, advise, and assist. So it will also go shoulder to shoulder with the with the staff and the, and the APUs that are that are on those different reserves to try to upskill them, try to pass on some of the lessons that we've learned and help them apply it in the realm of conservation, protecting endangered species, anti-poaching, counter-poaching, whatever you want to call that. Uh, so that that's our focus. It's it's a poaching is Endangered animals is not an animal problem, it's a human problem. So our focus, our mindset is that human problems require human solutions. So, and, and it's not just, it's not about tactics either. It's not about just teaching somebody how to shoot or how to make those decisions or do an arrest. It, it's about, hey, it's, it's a thinking game. So using advanced critical thinking, how can we be predictive and proactive to Pre prevent that from occurring. Uh, understanding, you know, the education aspect of it, we're trying to bridge the gap because there is a gap between conservationists, ecologists, and uh, counter poaching units, anti poaching units. So, by also including that education, working with the different veterinarians and uh, con conservationists, ecologists to upskill and train the rangers who, who work on these reserves, by them having a better understanding of. That all the different animals, their environment, the homeostasis, the baseline of the veld, uh, they can be more uh, insightful as to uh, hey, what are the pre event indicators to potential uh, poaching going to occur. Because there's, in any type of event, any type of criminal activity, there are always pre event indicators. So that's the mindset, that's the way that we look at that. So well, initially what happens is we blindfold the animal and we plug its ears to minimize stress. Then we drill into the horns and we attach the infusion device um, so that the liquid compounds are then infused into the horn under high pressure. We use about 8 to 9 bar of pressure to get into those fibrous spicules of the horn and the horn material. So you're looking at about 100 milliliters of liquid that actually enters the horn and then infuses over the horn material over time.